Thank you, David. Let me begin by telling you the situation in which you find yourselves tonight. As you know, some of you know, that I grew up in the AME Church. And this young minister who had been sent to college and to seminary returned to the district and the bishop assigned him to a church in rural Georgia. Excited about the beginning of his pastoral ministry, he rushed to this small town in Georgia and went around on Saturday to say, I'm the new pastor here and I look forward to seeing you Sunday morning at St. John's AME Church. Sunday morning came. It was raining and thundering. Streets unpaved or muddy to the point of being unpassable. At 9.30 for Sunday school, nobody showed up. Nobody showed for Sunday school at all. At 11 o'clock at the beginning of the service, nobody showed. The preacher's there by himself. And finally at 11.20, one soul parishioner shows up for the church service. And the young pastor rushes down and says, brother, I'm the new pastor here. And in seminary, they did not teach us what to do when only one worshiper shows for the worship service. He said, do you have any suggestions as to what I would do in this situation? And the soul parishioner says, well, preacher, I ain't a preacher. I was a farmer, and all I know is that when I load my wagon full of hay to go feed my cows, and only one cow shows up for the feeding, I feeds him. And so the pastor went up into the pulpit and sang the morning hymn. He read from the Old Testament and the New Testament, sang a second morning hymn, followed by a 15-minute morning prayer, followed by the altar call. And after the altar call, he preached a 45-minute sermon. <laughs> And after the 45-minute sermon, he opened the doors of the church, but there were no, nobody to join. And, and then he served Holy Communion. And after Holy Communion, he made the announcements. And after the announcements, he <laughs> took up the collection. <clears throat> and after the collection, he wanted to welcome the visitors but there were no visitors to welcome. And so he made the announcements and finally he got around to the benediction and the doxology. And when he finished, he rushed down to the soul parishioner and he says, well, brother, how did I do on my first Sunday? And the brother said, well, preacher, I ain't a preacher, I was a farmer. And all I know is that when I load my wagon full of hay, to go feed my cows, and only one sheep shows up, cow shows up for the feeding, I don't give him the whole damn load. <laughs> that is to say to you, I did not come here to talk for three minutes. I brought a whole load of paper, and I'm going to say every damn word. <laughs> it 
It's a great privilege to be honored here tonight alongside Ken Chenault, Cheryl Eiffel, and Judge Robert Wilkins, three paragons of the legal profession and of professional excellence. But it feels odd for me to be here in our nation's capital accepting an award for global leadership at a time when America's global leadership is in question. In the last year, I have been asked many times to reflect and comment and commiserate on the state of our country. And each time as I recount my own experience, it is important to remember that when we doubt or disagree with our leaders, we are not governed by them, we are governed by laws. So when those we elect seek to subvert norms of behavior, we have rights and laws to fall back on. And when elected officials seek to subvert the rights and laws of this country, we have lawyers, judges, and courts to fall back on. That has been our history and our journey as a nation. And it has been my journey as well. And at times like these, we need to be reminded of that journey because while so much of what we are experiencing today is not normal, is also not new. Although our situation may feel unprecedented and our course may feel uncharted, I've come to say tonight that we have been here before. I'm reminded of my earliest exposure to American politics, growing up in Atlanta, Georgia in 1943. There was a gubernatorial race when the then governor, Eugene Talmadge, was running for re-election. And I'm sitting in our apartment in the first public housing project built for black people in America and Governor Eugene Talmadge comes on WSB radio and says, fellow Georgians, I am running for re-election. I have two planks in my platform, niggers and roads. I'm against the first and for the second. This is exactly what President Trump is saying now, except his two planks or immigrants and jobs. He's against the first and claims to be for the second. So the words may change, but the policy remains the same. We have been here before. So when executive orders bar people from our shores based on what they look like or how they worship, it is hard not to hear echoes of Strom Thurmond on the campaign trail in 1948 or the cry of George Wallace in the schoolhouse door in 1963 saying segregation today, tomorrow, forever. We have been here before. When we hear the president talk about law and order, or the Attorney General talk about filth or exaggerate cr urban crime rates. It is not hard, it is hard not to hear the growl of Richard Nixon who used those same dog whistles. We have been here before. When the President abruptly fires those people tasked with investigating him, and does damage to our democratic institutions. It is not hard to remember the days of Watergate and the Saturday night massacre. We have been here before. Some may call this a regression, but it may also be called the most recent, most overt iteration of the oppression we have long endured. But what does it mean that we have been here before 
and why does it matter? Well, first, because we have been here before, we know this will pass. But the truth of something passing does not absolve us if we are passing. But how do we contain the damage? How do we heal the wounds? Even as it seems new ones are inflicted daily, those who practice, defend, and advance the law have a special obligation to be active. And all of us have an obligation to press on. Indeed, because we have been here before, we know we will endure. When our ancestors were taken from their homes and shipped across the sea, bought and sold and bound with the chains of slavery, we endured. When the framers of the Constitution decided we were three-fifths of a person, we endured. When the Dred Scott decision stated that a black man had no rights that a white man was bound to respect, we endured. And after the Civil War, after the Union was broken and put back together, after slavery dissolved and victory declared, when so many thought the war's conclusion meant the battle's end, we endured. We endured the Black Codes of Reconstruction. We endured when the Supreme Court said in Plessy v. Ferguson that segregation was legal, that separate was fine as long as it was equal, which it never was. We endured poll taxes at the voting booth and burned crosses in the churchyards. We endured dogs and fire hoses as we marched in Birmingham and our history of endurance, history commemorated in these very halls and celebrated here tonight, should give us faith that we shall once again endure. But our journey teaches us also that endu endurance is not enough. We do not sing we shall endure, we sing, we shall overcome. And you may be wondering, how do we overcome? Well, because we have been here before, we know there is a way forward. I am of the belief that in order to change a nation, you must, of course, change hearts and minds but you must also change the laws. And to change the laws, you need good lawyers. Or to put it in more loyally terms, yes, the meek shall inherit the earth, but you're going to need a lawyer to probate the will. <laughs> yes, lawyers were the backbone of the civil rights movement, starting with the dean of Howard University Law School Charles Hamilton Houston. And when I was a student at Howard University Law School, I sat in the moot courtroom and watched in awe as the lawyers and giants of the movement prepared their arguments for the Supreme Court. Legends, you know them, Thurgood Marshall, Robert Carter, Constance Baker Motley, William T. Coleman, James Neighbor, Jack Greenberg, Oliver Hill, Robert Ming, Bill Bryant, Elaine Jones, Julius Chambers, at breaks during their dry runs. When I was a student, they would huddle outside of the courtroom, and my classmates and I would stand close by just to hear what they were saying, standing in their proximity was a part of our education and a part of our inspiration. And the work to change this nation stretched far beyond its capital. Lawyers across the country
contributed to the movement. Wiley Branton in Arkansas, Vernon Jordan in Crawford in Alabama, Don Hollowell in Georgia, Avon Williams in Tennessee, Julius Chambers in North Carolina. Just eight weeks after my graduation from Howard Law School in June of 1960, I traveled with Don Hollowell to a small town in rural Georgia, Reedsville, where we were there representing an 18-year-old black man who had been arrested, arraigned, indicted, tried, convicted, and sentenced to die in the electric chair in the space of 48 hours. The proceedings were held in the segregated courthouse of Tattnall County. My colleagues Don Hollowell and C.B. King and I slept in the nearest colored motel 30 miles away in Dublin, Georgia. Every day we would appear in court and plead our client's day case. Every day at lunch, the white lawyers and court officials, everyone but us, would go to the square across the square to the white-only cafe, and we three black lawyers would go to the local grocery store for sliced bologna, a loaf of bread, a jar of mustard, and a Coca-Cola, which we would eat in our car, parked in the courthouse square. On the third day of the trial, a black woman sitting in the colored section upstairs dropped a book which got my attention. She beckoned me to the lobby. I met her there and she whispered, lawyer, we've been watching you all eat bologna sandwiches for two days now. Don't eat today. After court, come to my home for lunch. And she gave me the direction. When we arrived, we saw a beautiful sight, a table set for royalty, her best silver, china, and crystal, a lace tablecloth, beautifully folded white cloth napkins, and the most exquisite southern cuisine I've ever eaten. Some 10 black women and their husbands joined hands with us around the table for the grace. I shall never forget as long as I live one sentence in that prayer. Lord, way down here in Tattnall County, we can't join the NAACP, but thanks to your bountiful blessings, we can feed the NAACP lawyers. I would like to accept this award tonight on behalf of those wonderful black people in 1960 in Tattnall County, because that's when I knew I had chosen the right path. Even though it was warped laws that defined and circumscribed life in the Jim Crow South, it was also the law far-sighted, fair-minded jur jurisprudence that gave us the tools to dismantle segregation piece by rotten piece. And it has been lawyers who have bent that arc of the universe towards justice. The law continues to hold this extraordinary power to remake itself, to correct correct injustice and further justice. And it is clear that in our current fight for justice, lawyers must continue to lead the charge. So I would like to leave you with the words of the 19th century English reformer, Lord Brum, who spoke of the law in terms that have relevance to our day 
to our day and our time. Lord Brahm said, it was the boast of Augustus that he found Rome of brick and left it marble, a praise not unworthy of a great prince, but how much nobler will be our sovereign's boast when he shall have it to say that he found law dear and left it cheap, found it a sealed book, left it a living letter, found it the patrimony of the rich, left it the inheritance of the poor, found it the two-edged sword of craft and oppression, and left it the staff of honesty and the shield of innocence. Thank you and good night.